Mariah Carey is already thawing, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is August, and I am doing a live stream on Christmas because they never stop, do they? Yes, the anti-Christmas, it's all pagan crowd, is at it again. So I'm going to back everybody up, give you a kind of a heads up what's going on. Uh, Jim Staley, who is a Torah-observant Christian, runs his own ministry, I believe in Missouri, called Passion for Truth, uploaded a documentary on March 25th, titled December 25th on Trial. The very same day, myself and a Catholic friend of mine responded. We pointed out it was riddled with problems. A few days later, Jim took the documentary down, but then he uploaded a short video saying, well, I'm going to fix some things and then re-upload it. Well, he did a couple weeks ago. And I titled this Jim Staley, Ex Jim Staley Exposed because that's what's going to basically happen today, everybody. He basically re-uploaded the same documentary with minor changes. It's still filled with problems constantly, just utter problems. And so at this point, he's got to know he's lying. He's using basically lies about historical data, like what St. Epiphanius or Archbishop Braga said, to support his claim that Christmas is pagan. I mean, you can, when he did it the first time, you could say, well, maybe he just did poor research. Now that he has taken the documentary down after we critiqued it, then he re-uploads it with the same information, there's no excuse anymore. Jim Staley is lying to you. And for any of his followers that might be watching right now, if he's lying to you about this, what also is he lying to you about? Now, that doesn't mean he is. He could be right about everything else he's saying in just this one fluke, but it's a red flag at least. If he's lying to you about this, you should be asking, what else is he lying to you about? And so that's why we're doing this. We're going to show how this guy is basically lying. Now, my friend, Will, who is the Jolly Viking, was going to be here with me to respond to this. Unfortunately, he's having some connectivity issues. So he may come in at some point, join us as we go through this lovely documentary. Now, we're not going to respond to every single point again. We don't need to rehash everything. I'll, I'll re-hit that. Uh, some of the main points here. Uh, for those that are interested, uh, I link below down in the video description our original live stream where we basically go through and critique everything quite easily. And I also uh, have this short little blog up here. So if you guys check this out on my uh, WordPress blog, we just go through and we list basically numerous errors. Uh, but basically, basically give you the highlights of all the problems. The ironic part is a lot of these same errors are still in Jim's documentary. The, the current one, the one he re-uploaded. So a lot of this stuff like him taking uh, uh, the uh, Philokalian calendar out of context, uh, misunderstanding what Epiphanius is saying, all this stuff is still there. So if you're interested, you get the highlights right basically there, or you can go watch our other live stream. But we'll get into this now. We're going to start going through certain parts of it. I'm not, again, I'm not going to rehash everything, but I mean, there's a lot here we can still cover because he does change a couple things. He does add a couple new things in. And I thought it was just good to sort of show this as also just once again, show Christmas is not pagan, but also show how proponents of this basically manipulate the data to push their anti-holiday agenda. Why? I mean, we'll get into a little bit of that. So here we get going. Let me make sure we're all set here. Yep, everything looks good. All right. In this video, we're going to discover the answer to why do we celebrate the birthday of Christ on December 25th. Did the Roman Church choose it simply because it was an existing pagan holiday to a sun god and they wanted to keep Christians from worshiping the sun? Or is there more to the story? We're going to find the answer to those questions and many more in this video. But right off the bat, I want to say that if you consider yourself an academic, you may not agree with every piece of evidence presented in this trial. You don't have to. Right there and then he's setting it up that it's him versus academics, that somehow academics are not going to uh, agree with this. But notice what he goes on to say now. We all have our own bias, and even the scholars disagree with each other on even the most obvious and clear evidence. Everyone has a bias. Including you, Jim. But also, if you look at scholars who have actually written on this topic, who've written on the history of Christmas, why the date was chosen, 
it's basically unanimous as far as I can tell. There may be a few minor dissenters here and there. But the overwhelming majority of scholars who've written within the past 50 years agree there is no evidence December 25th was picked because of pagan holiday reasons. There's also not even a lot of good evidence there was a holiday on December 25th prior to Constantine. There was no pagan holiday on that date. So Jim is sort of setting up here this, this laying this groundwork here that just isn't accurate. Scholars are not debating over this topic. If you read scholars like Tanya Gulovich, Stephen Hyman's, uh, Peter Nothat, Thomas Taylor, Thomas Schmidt, Ronald Hutton, they all agree <laughs> December 25th had nothing to do with paganism. Christians didn't pick that date because of paganism. So he's already setting up this, this something is just blatantly inaccurate. At the end of the day, our own court system pronounces this, and even the scholars disagree with each other. One second here. My audio cut out, and I'm not sure why. Can you guys still hear me? I want to make sure everybody can still hear me because I can't hear the video. On even the most obvious go. and clear evidence. Everyone has a bias. At the end of the day, our own court system pronounces guilt when the evidence is just beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's exactly what we're going to do. After all, how much poison needs to be in a glass of water for the whole whole glass hold on one second once again guys for some reason my audio is kicking can you guys still hear the video just let me know okay yeah i for some reason cannot hear it and i'm not sure why it must be my earbuds here so the only thing to do at this point is to take them out and put them back in because obviously they're not connecting for some reason and i don't want to get any feedback going through the mic because that would be horrible for you guys so they probably just disconnected from the computer which you know happens occasionally so let's make sure that's working. Glass to be there. polluted, not much at all. But right now you might be asking yourself the question, who cares when Jesus was born? What does it matter if the Catholic Church chose December 25th to be the date of his birth or any other day for that matter? Well, if it was all about us, it wouldn't matter. But the reality is it's not about us. It's about him. We're worshiping him. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 12, he already told us that we're not allowed to take things, traditions, or days and how the pagans used to worship their gods, look into those, and then creatively borrow from them, Christianize them, throw a little holy water on them, and then offer them up to the one true God. We're not allowed to do that. Okay, here's the problem. That is wildly taking Deuteronomy 12 out of context. The passage says you can't do any of the abominable things that God hates. Okay, here's the problem. If you look into the ancient cultures, Ancient pagans had temples, yet God commanded Israel to build a temple. Ancient pagans had priests, yet God commanded priests. God commanded animal sacrifice. There's a great book called Israelite Religions by Richard Hess, and he notes that Israel's religious festivals were picked around specific dates to match already existing pagan festivals in Canaan. Because, for example, throughout Canaan, and we find this at the city of Emmer, there was a festival called the Zucru Festival which basically align with a lot of the fall festivals that Israel has. And scholars will note that Israel picked their festivals to prevent Israelites from partaking in pagan worship. You can't go partake in pagan worship if you're already worshiping the God of Israel kind of thing is what the criteria was. So what a lot of Torah observant anti-holiday Christians do is they take that passage, they, were, they basically throw it out constantly. Uh, endlessly, and Jim is just another example of someone doing that, and say, can't do anything a pagan ever did. Well, that's not what God is saying. If that was the case, they'd have to throw out half of the Old Testament, because there's so much in there that pagans already did, but Jim is just not being honest about that issue. So, uh, this for, does not show at all. And then again, just go to Acts 17, for example. You have in Acts 17, Paul quotes the pagan Stoic philosopher Aratus. In him, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And he applies that to the God of Israel. By that logic, Jim would say that Paul is committing a sin here. He's taking something that was used to honor a pagan deity, the Stoic uh, pantheistic God, and he's applying it to the God of Israel. Obviously, <laughs> you are taking me, we cannot read into Deuteronomy 12. God is not saying you cannot do anything a pagan has ever done. He's saying, don't do the abominable things like 
offering up your children because that's in the context. So again, they constantly use this passage incorrectly and take it out of context and just showing how absurd the absurdities their uh, beliefs would lead to, lead to debunks their whole argument here. We're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth the way he commanded. And we're not allowed to add or take away from that. So if December 25th was in fact the birthday of pagan sun gods and the Roman church chose to change the birthday of Christ to that day, that would be like me trying to change the birthday of my wife to the birthday of one of my old girlfriends. So this is an analogy Jim likes to use. If we are moving the date of Jesus's birthday, December 25th, that's like taking your wife's birthday and wanting to celebrate it on your ex-girlfriend's birthday. This analogy doesn't work, and yet he continues to use it. It doesn't work simply because God created all the days. Your wife only has a specific birthday, but God literally owns every day. Every day is about honoring God. So it doesn't matter what day we choose. Like, again, God is not going to care that the pagans were having the Zucru festival in the fall long before Israel started worshiping him on the select days he chose. He doesn't care about that because all the days are his. If anything, we should be thinking that this, with December 25th, since it's God's day anyway, we should reclaim it even if it is a pagan holiday. But of course, there's no evidence it is. And let's get into some of that data here coming up. Uh, but I want to go through a little bit more of the introduction here. Uh, he gives this analogy of his wife getting mad about that. It falls apart easily if you just think about it a little bit. So I don't know why he keeps using it. But Right now, virtually all Christians are following a religious calendar that was created by the early Roman church and does not contain a single holiday that's on God's calendar. Could the body of Christ corporately be missing out on blessings and be suffering from a lack of power because it's chosen to worship God through man-made holidays and traditions of men rather than the holy days created by God? Okay, this is utter nonsense. We're not missing out on blessings because we don't keep Jewish feasts. There's no evidence that is the scriptural reading there. I don't even see how he can think that logically follows. We're, like this is fear mongering, and this is like close to like prosperity gospel. Do what we tell you to, and you'll be blessed in certain ways. Like that's not how our relationship with God works. Okay, He shows favoritism to no one. He will bless who He will bless. He will curse who He curse. At this, this is not this idea that we somehow get re certain special rewards for keeping certain festivals, and it's fear mongering. Oh well, we really if we really want. To follow God perfectly, we got to be keeping this, and there's just no evidence for that. There's a long debate throughout church history, but overwhelming majority of scholarly consensus and church fathers is that we're not, we don't need to keep these feasts anymore. They're not for us. We now uh, have the events of the New Testament we're allowed to celebrate, and this has been church tradition for two thousand years. So again, we this is just utter fear mongering. There's no evidence that if we just started keeping Jewish feasts, we're going to be blessed in certain ways. And again. If we're supposed to keep the feast, we shouldn't be doing it because we're going to get rewarded. We should be doing it because we want to love God. So I don't even know what he's going on about with this. If you believe you're a Christian, a believer that wants to worship God in spirit and truth, then we need to look into everything that we believe and find out what spirit does it actually come from. And is it the truth? So. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because, again, uh, there's a lot of fluff, and I'm only going to try to hit some of his main points here. Uh, but let's get to some of his actual evidence now. And, again, we're not going to rehash everything we went into the old live stream we did a few months ago. Uh, you can watch that, or you can see the clip notes I have linked below. Quotes, and find out if the evidence leads us to a conclusion that we can say is definite. Let's start off with an ancient manuscript that was discovered in 1918. It contains 38 sermons that most scholars attribute to John Chrysostom, who lived in the 4th century. Within these sermons that are attributed to Chrysostom is another homily that is said to be by an obscure author named Pontius Maxima. The oldest manuscript that we have of these sermons is from the 9th century. This means that whoever the author is, he was either a contemporary of Chrysostom in the 4th century or a Christian author sometime after John, but before the 9th century. In this homily, he not only details for us that December 25th was in fact considered by the ancients the birthday of the Roman sun god, but it also helps us understand how the early Christians attempted to appropriate this day and Christianize it. In it, he says this, quote, They also call it, they being the pagans, birthday of the Invictus, which means unconquered. But who is Invictus if not our Lord, who suffered death and then conquered it? Or when they call it birthday of the sun, 
Well, Christ is the son of righteousness that the prophet Malachi spoke of. The ancient winter solstice, my friends, which was December 25th, is exactly what is being referenced here. This ancient quote is stating that the pagans, as early as possibly the 4th century, called the winter solstice the birthday of the sun god. Duh! Okay, for those who don't know, let me rehash this point. Okay, what Jim is going to do throughout this documentary is he's going to take quotes from the 4th, 5th century of Christians, pagans, you name it, claiming that they worship the sun on December 25th. We know. Because once again, in 354 AD, the Philokalian calendar, the calendar of Philokalus, states that there was a pagan holiday on December 25th. We know. John Chrysostom, Augustine, Archbishop Braga, Epiphanius, they're all writing after that calendar. We know there was a pagan holiday on the date mid-4th century. The question becomes, was it on that date prior to Constantine? And there is no evidence it was. Let me show you something here. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'm going to open another window. Holy crap, the Jolly Vikings here. One second. Let me get my window open. Finally, he got here. It took forever, he's stupid internet issues. Okay, but this is good because I'm about to get into Latin and I want him here to read this Latin. Get in here, you lazy, late Viking. <laughs> <you. laughs> I figured out what the problem was. So that, that's that's good at least. Oh, good. Well, Can you guys so, hear me? Welcome, everyone. The Jolly Viking, who was our favorite Catholic ever, is here to join us. <laughs> How are you doing today? Oh, just... Wonderful. I well, I can't hear you. You might be muted, so you may uh, need to check your audio. Hang on. So anyway, while you're fixing figuring that out, uh, this is an inscription that someone sent me. Okay, so did you get your audio figured out? Because I hear something now. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep. Can hear uh, you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, so doing fine. Problem is, is that I had to watch this video in preparation for doing this live stream, and now I'm now I'm exhausted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Well, welcome. <sighs> so we're going over the Licinius inscription. So someone on Twitter right. sent this to me. I think his name is like Dark Blade or something. And I, I can, very thankful for him finding this because I I couldn't find this mentioned in any current scholar. So it seems to have been missed for a long time. But inscription eight nine four zero. Okay, it, it mentions sun worship. Okay. At the end of November, under the Emperor Licinius. Now, who's Licinius? That is Constantine's co-ruler. They were ruling at the same time until they fought a civil war. Constantine became sole emperor. And I believe about, what is it, 324? Will, is that correct? Yeah, three, yeah, 323, 324. I forget yeah, when. You're muted again, I can't hear you. But basically, Battle of Byzantium is more or less the end of... Uh, was it Licinius in the East? I think so. Um, who is the main ruler? Hey, your audio is cutting in and out. I can't hear you anything. We're against Darn. You. Um, you and your technical issues. But yeah, this basically says that sun worship before Constantine became the sole emperor of the of the world. Inscription 8940. Okay, basically, it says right then and there that they were worshiping the sun in late November. If you go into the Philokalian calendar, it says Emperor Aurelian worshiped the sun with chariot races in October uh, every four years. If you look back in the Julio-Claudian fast die inscriptions before Constantine again, they're saying that sun worship is in August and early December, I believe like December 7th. So why is it that everything before Constantine, we see sun worship on other dates, November, October, early December, August, and then after Constantine, we have a plethora of inscriptions, or not inscriptions, but texts telling us that this December 25th is when sun worship. Well, the most likely explanation, in my view, is that once the Christians took over and Constantine was a Christian, they started celebrating Christmas on December 25th. The pagans put a holiday on that day to compete with Christians. If it was the other way, if the Christians overtook a pagan holiday, we should see a ple plethora of inscriptions and texts prior to Constantine. But we don't. We see the opposite. They all come post-Constantine, which tells me that there's no evidence there was a pagan holiday on December 25th prior to Constantine. Again, even current to Constantine, this Licinius inscription, 8940, has sun worship in November. You there, Will? Yeah, can you hear me better now? Yeah, um, that's much better. Yeah, so I, I just need to switch over to my actual microphone rather than 
the okay, thing I'm no, using. Okay, now it's not working. So I don't oh. know what you keep doing. It works for a second and then I, you go away. Is uh, is it working I'm now? I'm going to pull the video back up because I'm still not hearing you. Is it working so now? Figure, yeah, it's working now. Interesting. I don't, yeah, I don't know. You talk fine and then it stops. So I wonder I if it's wrong. I wonder if it's canceling out whenever you. Yep, you're not. You're gone again. Uh, yeah, I was I was gonna say I wonder if it's canceling out when you speak. I don't know if it's an audio issue, if you got bad internet. I don't know. Yeah, because I get like there and then it went away. Well, all right, let's play a little bit more of this while Will figures out his life. <laughs> uh, see, I heard you laugh there, and yep. then your audio cuts in and out. Say something, Will. Do you have anything to say? Uh, I'm going to try uh, this on a different browser. I'm gonna see if Firefox. Well, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm hearing you now. Like, just what is your? Do you have any comments on the inscription? Um. So I uh, I didn't actually read that. So um, and it was hard to see it uh, through the through the stream or anything like that. But I agree with the basic point that yes, if we were to um, if if Constantine was the one who created the um, the sun god. Uh, date for Christian. Uh, basically, Constantine was the one to uh, cause Christians to start worshiping Jesus's birthday on December 25th because of the fact that he um, was trying to make it more in line with the um, with the pagan sun god worship that was already present. Then we should see the exact opposite of what we're currently seeing, which is um, no references to sun god worship on December 25th before Constantine. And only references to sun god worship on December twenty fifth after Constantine, like that's the exact opposite of what we should be seeing. Yeah, everyone is saying they hear you fine. It's probably just my headphones have been okay. Up good, up that's that's so good in that case. Probably just you. So, all right, yeah. well, let's keep playing here, um, and then I'll just figure out if it's my headphones acting up. It's my headphones, but I was going to jump ahead to the eight minute mark here uh, okay. because again. Again, Jim just cites Augustine. He keeps citing people that are post-dating the Philo Kale encounter. Mm -hmm. We know that's not actually evidence that Christmas was pagan prior to Constantine. That's yeah, the real question here. It, it's interesting because there is there is one example that he gives of someone before Constantine uh, who 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 has a semi-relevant quote to with the Plutarch quote, but we'll get we'll get to that. Um, yeah, I believe it's Pliny the Elder, and Pliny the Elder says it's the winter solstice, but we'll get to that. Right. All right. Here. Here we go. Winter solstice this day of the year. It's the day when the sun appears to stop and begins to turn back around and the days get longer. So the ancients called it the day when the sun was reborn. This is why sun god's birthdays were on this day, because this is the day that the sun begins to be reborn from their perspective. This is the day when the days begin to get longer and the sun begins to take over the night. And so we will see the winter solstice being used to worship sun gods all throughout time and almost on every continent. Take a look at Newgrange tomb in Ireland. One where thing there's that a I small always, window. Always, sorry. 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 Yeah. I'm just trying to fix my headphones there. Yeah. One thing that I always find fascinating only with about... the winter solstice for 17 minutes each year. The window of that tomb was specifically created over 5,000 years ago to harness the sun just for those 17 minutes. All right. Yeah, I want to let him finish his thought. What were you saying there? Sure. Yeah. One thing that I always find fascinating about this particular argument whenever I hear it is it does make sense. It, it's 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 similar with a lot of conspiracy theory logic where um, when you just simply say the, the idea, it actually does kind of make sense. Mm -hmm. um, but then... It doesn't actually accord with any evidence. That that's the problem. Is that yeah? If if you just talk about it, it does kind of make sense for the birthday of the sun to be the winter solstice, the time mm -hmm. when the sun stops sinking and then starts rising once again. That that literally does make sense. And I know that this was a, a point that um, what was it? Zeitgeist made back in the early two thousands about why, like how Christ is Christ's story is this astrological symbol or whatever. But then you actually look at the evidence and it's just not there. It, it, it's not historical. It makes sense. But that wasn't the logic that these ancient people actually applied to the situation. That's what's hilarious about it. Exactly. And also, what Jim is doing at this point, he's 
finding tombs. He's talking. He talks about Stonehenge after this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a place in Germany, a place in Egypt. These are thousands of years old. These Brit these Britannic and these Germanic uh, 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 sites that he's talking about. Let me just right. quote Ronald Hutton at length. He wrote a book called The Stations of the Sun, and here's what he says. Now, Ronald Hutton is a pagan and a historian. He's not a Christian. He was actually looking for ancient paganism in holidays in his book to just try to so they could try to reconstruct some sort of pagan history or some sort of modern pagan religion. He didn't find any. Here's what he says about these ancient Britannic structures. He says, to sum up, it is clear that at particular times and places in British and Irish prehistory, the cardinal points of the sun, and particularly the winter solstice, had considerable ritual importance. Nonetheless, the vast majority of prehistoric monuments in these islands do not relate to any of them, so that no overall or enduring pattern of cult can be detected. Furthermore, a considerable gulf separates all these monuments from the pre-Roman British Iron Age. Not one of the temples of which has yet been found to have possessed a significant solar alignment. Literary sources do not tell us anything conclusive about the midwinter practices of the ancient British Isles. The Irish tales, which most commonly reflect the pagan past, the Ulster cycle, do not mention any midwinter, midwinter feast at all, but emphasize those at the beginning of the seasons. So, Maybe some 5,000 years ago in Britain, the winter solstice was important. There is no evidence there's any sort of continuity up to the Roman period that the Christians could have hijacked. This mm -hmm. is just baseless conjecture that Jim is making here. Historians still debate about what was the significance with these tombs. There's no evidence it was a holiday at this point. That's a conjecture this far. Yeah, and I, and I do have more to say, but I want to wait until we get to the Aztec portion of, uh, of the video. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> because we'll that's, yeah. that's something that Basically, I think that's the final point time he makes like this point about winter solstices and temples and stuff like that. And, and that's where I want to address this whole argument. Yeah, we're not going to rehash everything we did last time in right. March. Now, we, we, we in March, I quoted an actual Egyptologist on the temple of Amun-Ra. Jim mm -hmm. seems to think that just from the temple, he can extrapolate and argue that the Egyptians had a winter solstice festival dedicated to Amun-Ra on December 25th. So I quoted an actual Egyptologist just saying, there's no evidence of that. So right. again, go to the experts. Jim is not an expert. He makes numerous errors, as you'll see. And we're going to get to some lies up here soon. So let's go to 1211 here. So Satan chose this day, the winter solstice, added a solar deity to it, then threaded it all throughout time. And then eventually his plan was to get it into the church. Because if he could get it into the church, then the people of God would move away from the true calendar of God and be paralyzed from receiving the full power and authority in the earth that he desires for his people to have. He would trick us into not doing Bible things in Bible ways, but literally mocking God through a date chosen by Satan to worship him. And all the while, we wouldn't have a clue that we're offending the one true God. The entire Okay, who does Jim worship? Is his God very insecure? Are we worried about dates? Like, and he exclaims if we don't keep God's specific feasts we found in, in the Pentateuch, mm -hmm. well, we're losing power. I mean, this is snake oil salesman. Follow me, do what I tell you, and you'll gain power and blessings. Don't. You're going to offend God because he gets very offended by dates. I mean, what's interesting, I'm not sure if, uh, if he's ever addressed this point in other videos. I'm sure you can testify to this. But there there is a whole corpus of Christian literature, both in the early church, the Middle Ages, as well as into modern times, about what the purpose of the Jewish law was, why God... I remember, now he's probably not going to find any weight in this, but I remember Thomas Aquinas specifically talked about how um, when God delivered a law, a law code to the ancient Israelites, uh, because that's from God, we could you could actually make the argument that the ancient Israelite society is, is the closest to a perf perfectly just society um, for that time period and, and in that mm -hmm. place. But, but as with all law codes, every single law code is specifically is, is an application of universal law to a particular time period and to a particular people. There, there are no exceptions to this. Every single law code throughout all of human history yep. will always be an application of universal law to a particular society, which means that if you were to take the ancient Israelite law code and simply enforce it on a modern society, 
or any society for that matter, outside of that specific context, that would be an evil. That would you are taking a law code that was designed for a specific people and you are putting it on a people who are it is not specifically designed for. It's it, this is a, the exact thing that that he is trying to do here. Take the festivals, which are a con festivals are are indeed a constant throughout every single society. Why? Because it's part of human nature. It's part of human beings to have festivals. But to enforce a single set of festivals as they existed in an ancient Semitic society onto every single society that ever comes after, that is wrong. That, is, that totally misunderstands the purpose of the Jewish festivals. I would agree wholeheartedly with you. And the more I read the early church fathers, the more I, I definitely move in that direction. Yeah. Like, I started reading early church fathers to deal with Torah observant Christians, and it, and it moved me out of like evangelicalism and more to like a traditional understanding of Christianity for sure. But thank you, Green Plant. Thank you for sending in the super chat. I do appreciate that. Uh, only thing I want to say here is like, even uh, his, his whole methodology here just seems to be against the teachings of the New Testament. Like Paul mm -hmm. says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus Christ is reigning until all enemies are under his feet. Okay, if something is not sin, that implies, in my view, that we should go out and reclaim it for Christ. Like days, which God, all belong to God anyway. I mean, why do we want to surrender a day to the enemy? Okay, guess what? Even right. if December 25th was a pagan holiday, I want to reclaim it and make it holy. I don't understand these, these Torah observants who always are giving ground to the enemy. Oh, you can have Halloween. Okay, you can have Christmas now. Those are clearly your day. Like, you obviously don't understand the principles of the New Testament. I don't right. understand the logic at all. And I mean, this, this is more or less uh, Paul's point in Romans about how, I mean, with, with festivals in particular, I would, I would argue, though there are different interpretations of this passage. Romans 14, uh, verse 5, one person esteems one day as better than another, while others esteem all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that that probably has something to do with, feast, with festival days, because um, what Paul is talking about is... Um, what foods are appropriate for what days and, and things like that. I, th I think that that's probably what he's talking about. Um, I would so say they probably get that out of Colossians too, as well, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, have you ever heard Jim or Torah observers in ways they interpret like Colossians 2 or Romans 14? No, admittedly, I don't talk much to Torah <laughs> uh, observers or, or anything like that. We're not going to get into it here, but it's it's very convoluted. Uh, it, it basically is the reason I don't take their position. I don't say their interpretations of the New Testament are wrong. I say they're they're ad hoc. They're not parsimonious. They have to add all these additional assumptions mm -hmm. on top of the text to make their interpretation beyond parsimony. And that's right. just why I'm not a Torah observant Christian. And But yeah, it, it, if you ever get a chance, it's a wild ride. You, I, I remember reading it going, <sighs> what? I, I mean, I'm... I'm a traditionalist, so I, I already have to deal with all sorts of weirdos in my own church. So I, I uh, am a traditionalist too now. So yeah. All right, let's let's play. It can be established that the pagans were worshiping solar deities on the winter solstice before the Roman Church chose the date for the birthday of Christ, then it's all too possible that the church chose that date because it was a pagan celebration in their effort to displace it. An act that we will see later is biblically illegal. Okay, let me just summarize Jim's argument here. If he says if it can be established there was a pagan holiday on December twenty fifth, then it's and he says it's possible the Christians chose that date to hijack that holiday and date. That's a conjecture. I mean, even if there was like eighty pagan holidays on December twenty fifth, that is not the reason the Christians picked that date. And we know this because scholars like Thomas Taylor, Thomas Schmidt, Peter Nofath that pointed out. They actually thought that was Jesus's birthday. Mm -hmm. You know, earlier in his video, he's quoting Augustine. He's quoting John Chrysostom about how the mm -hmm. pagans worship on December 25th. He's ignoring the other parts of those quotes where they say, but Jesus really was born on December 25th. That's why we celebrate it. Okay. Why are you yeah. ignoring that part? Clearly I mean, the that's... Christians picked December 25th because they thought that was actually the day Jesus was born. Right. And I, it, it is funny because as, as we discussed in the last video, um, when we last responded to him, Chrysostom specifically uh, uprooted the traditional Greek celebration. I think it was on uh, basically on Epiphany of, of Christ's birthday yeah. and changed it to December 25th. He sp Chrysostom, if we're, if we're going to quote Chrysostom, we should at least incorporate what he actually said. Um, yeah. yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> Everyone he's quoting is a Christian, Augustine, John Chrysostom, they're doing the calculation theory. They're saying that we picked this date because that's actually the date we calculated as Jesus' birth. And he wants to accuse them, Jim wants to accuse them of picking that day because of paganism. So, again, he's going to say it's, it's just guys. based on superstition later. Um, yeah, he, we'll get to that. He'll use a double standard later on. But that, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's what he claims. It's like he thinks that. Let me just move a little bit ahead here and then we yeah. will keep going. Let's get because we're getting to the, the Plutarch quote. Remember, you said you wanted to get to that one? Yeah, I want, I, I especially wanted to get to that one because, okay. My main problem with this video, actually, is, is just the fact that um, he clearly did watch our our response. He clearly it's, did. It's clear that he watched basically the entire hour and a half to two hours or whatever. And he because he incorporates some of our criticisms. He he, yeah. he adds a couple of uh, like uh, defensive statements uh, in, in order to like ward us off or whatever. But he doesn't actually, but he seems to either have completely ignored what our actual criticisms of these things were or just not understood them. That's the only two explanations, really. Uh, yeah. But and we'll, we'll get to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, well, let's just keep going. Let's just play the Plutarch quote because this is mm -hmm. a perfect example of why I titled this as I did. And I put in the thumbnail, Jim, Jim Staley is lying because this is, a, this is what we're about to see is a perfect example of how he's lying. Now, let's go over to a Greek philosopher named Plutarch, who lived in the first century, and let him tell us why they built his temple around the winter solstice. He says, and I quote, For this reason, it is said that the goddess Isis, when she was aware of her being pregnant, put on a protective amulet on the sixth day of Phaophi, and on the winter solstice, she gave birth to Hippocrates. Now, Hippocrates was the sun god Horus as a child. It literally means the child Horus. Horus was the sun god of Egypt, and Plutarch is reporting that he was born on the winter solstice. So not only does Plutarch tell us that the sun god of Egypt was born on the winter solstice, but he does so long before a single Catholic writer ever decided to figure out what the birthday of Christ was. Okay, so this was something Jim used last time, and he what he changed here, he wrote, he, last time he said that Plutarch was writing in 65 AD. Right. His confusion was, as he was actually quoting from section 65 of mm -hmm. On Isis and Osiris. So he corrected that part when we pointed it out, but he's still using the same fall fallacious reasoning. And, okay, so three things here. Uh, <laughs> you, okay, first off, how do I want to order? Okay, so you actually talked with him briefly about the translation here and pointed out that... Uh, it doesn't say on the winter solstice. It says around the winter solstice. And he he fought back saying that, no, the, the original means on the winter solstice. Okay. No, so, no, no, that wasn't me. So my brother-in-law okay. named David Wilbur, who's got a channel, uploaded a short video, which he took down because Jim okay. took his original video down, where he pointed out that he'd used this whole example of Plutarch. Uh, Plutarch, again, he says around the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim is reinterpreting it to be on the winter solstice. And he's also ignoring the following line, which well, is for this reason, did, they bring him offerings and they celebrate his birth actually, in the spring. Yeah, I did actually want to get, yeah, I did actually want to get to the translation because I, I specifically, in, in preparation for this, just to make sure I wasn't absolutely going insane, I did reread the, the passage. The, the the relevant phrase is peri tropas kemerinas, uh, uh, which peri, is a Greek preposition was where we get the word perimeter. It literally means around. Do you think of like what a perimeter is? It's it's the yeah. line around something. Um, peri always means when used in time around the time of. It specifically doesn't mean during or on. It it does not mean that. It, if Plutarch had wanted to express the idea that this had happened during the winter solstice, then he would have said te trope kemerine. That's what he would have said. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it did mean on the winter solstice, this still doesn't matter for two reasons. One of them is the one that you just mentioned, that uh, that the celebration that's being referenced happens in the springtime, not on the winter, which this passage actually proves that there wasn't a celebration of Horus on the winter solstice. But even if it was, it still doesn't matter. Because Horus is not an Egyptian sun god. 
Exactly. He here he earlier he said in his documentary that Amon Ru Amon Ra was the sun. Right. Here he's saying that Horus is the sun. No, they are not Horus the same sun. deity. <laughs> no, Horus was more of a sky god. He held other areas of of the nature. Mm -hmm. He was not the sun god. This is a huge misunderstanding I get from conspiracy theorists all the time. Amon Ra was the sun god, not Horus. Now I will I will I will like give a little bit of uh, benefit of the doubt because iconography of Horus is very similar to on the, the iconography of Ra. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. There are distinct features which are different. So for instance, Amun Ra always has like the solar disc above his head. Um, whereas Horus usually has like um, more of the Egyptian Pharaoh crown sort of thing above his head. But both of them are a falcon. Uh, it, or at least very Falcon-like in both descriptions, in both inscriptions. So it, I can see where the confusion arises, but it is still a confusion. That's the thing. It's not an accurate portrayal of of uh, of Horus. Right. Anyway, and so those yeah, are so, the things I wanted to talk about. With but this, but this is this is just clear. Jim is lying. Well, he should know from David right. Wilbur, who talked to him directly, who uploaded a video from our live stream, mm -hmm. that this is not evidence of a winner celebration on december 25th some right. sun celebration on that date he, he, he either he either ignored it just completely forgot about it while re-editing the video or just didn't even understand the words we were saying it doesn't matter which version <laughs> of that it is he's proven himself to be an unreliable source of information here at the very yeah. least and I, I honestly, I think he's just lying. I think he's got an agenda. He needs Christmas to be pagan because I don't, he doesn't want to admit he was wrong about it. So he's including this in this, even though he knows this is wrong at this point. Multiple people have pointed it out to them. This to him. Yeah. And again, if you're one of his followers, if he's lying to you about this, what also is he lying to you about to mm -hmm. push his agenda? You got to yeah. think about that. It's one of those things where... Um... <laughs> yeah, we, we can just move on. Let's just move on. Let's move on because, again, he's just going to rehash a lot of the same stuff we debunked last time. Mm -hmm. well, let's move up here a little bit more. Uh, the good news is, at least in this version, he's not saying Plutarch wrote in 65 AD. However, he's saying the Plutarch right. in the first century on screen. That's probably inaccurate. Plutarch was probably writing at the beginning of the second century. So he still is not even getting that entirely right. Yeah, that's that's more of a minor mistake, in my opinion. That's something that I wouldn't harp on him too much for. No, I'll give him that. Yeah. So he's go. He goes over the Roman calendar. He goes over Epiphanius, which again, Epiphanius does not say there was a. He's even he's writing after the Philo Killian calendar, but Epiphanius doesn't even say that there was a the birth of a god on December twenty fifth. Aeon. He, he said it was Saturnalia. Saturnalia. Yeah, he says Saturnalia was on December twenty fifth, which, which he's wrong right. about. Like right. every scholar agrees, Epiphanius got that wrong. Right. Uh, Saturnalia was on December seventeenth. But Jim says he claims there was the birth of Aeon was celebrated on December 25th. Wrong. Aeon, Epiphanius thinks that Aeon was birth was celebrated on January 6th or 7th. Right. So Jim is just yeah. wrong. But now Jim tries something new here. He actually tries to quote Stephen Hyman's, which is a scholar I have used extensively. We know that they didn't celebrate it in the third century on December 25th. So he's talking about Christians here. Let me go back a little bit. He is. I want to make sure we get all the context in here. So he's talking about Christians celebrating Christmas. Ironically, on this very same calendar of 354, December 25th is also mentioned as the birthday of Christ. And we know that they didn't celebrate it in the 3rd century on December 25th because Dr. Stephen Hidgmans tells us that in the De Pascha Computus, which was written in 243 AD to determine the date of Easter, they argued that Christ, the new son of righteousness, must have been born on March 28th. This tells us that in the mid-3rd century, the date of Christmas was not yet known, and its date would be chosen sometime after this and before 354 calendar, most likely during the reign of Emperor Constantine of the 330s. Okay, a lot of problems here. Uh, for one, he's quoting Stephen Hyman's, and he's not going into what Stephen Hyman's actually says in detail. Stephen Hyman's uh, has a lot. Uh, he read basically the first two pages of Stephen Hyman's work. <laughs> So let me actually pull up Stephen Hyman's paper here to show you the actual context. So you guys can just see, because I've, I've read from this a lot of times. So this is Stephen Hyman's paper. Sorry for, let me move that, see if I can move that over a little bit, or at least, thank you for the super chat. Let me move that down there so we can see a little bit more of it. Okay. So let me just read this at length a little bit here. Okay. So uh, basically he's talking about a very specific reply to uh, Hippolytus of Rome here. So 
None of the dates was, in, was influenced or enjoyed or any preference of a, uh, official recognition. Their basis varied from learning, learning calculations to pure guesswork. Uh, de, pa de Pasca de Computis, for instance, written in AD 243, argued the creation began with the vernal equinox, March 25th, and that the sun created on the fourth day was therefore created on March 28th, obviously meant that Christ, the new righteousness, must have been born on March 28th. To support these dates, the author proclaimed explicitly that he had been inspired by Ab Ipso Deo. All right. So, yeah, we have a work arguing that Christ was born on this day. This is a reply. Stephen Hyman's notes, this is a reply uh, to Hippolytus's calculation. Uh, it's, he's trying to correct it. But if you go down, Stephen Hyman does, does, doesn't agree with Jim. He argues that there's no evidence that they would have picked the day because of December, because of some pagan holiday. So he says later on, he says, all scholars who argue that Christmas was instituted to counteract the pagan feast of December 25th in honor of Sol strongly emphasize the pagan nature of that feast and the great importance of the popularity of Sol Invictus in late antiquity. Little evidence is offered for the former contention beyond references to 30 chariot races in honor of Sol recorded in the calendar of 354. Okay. Right there, he says there's just no evidence of this. Like, yeah, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things where this was a very popular theory like a hundred years ago. Exactly. Um, which is why I, I got annoyed again. I, I brought that up. I brought this up last time, which is why I got really annoyed when he again cited the Catholic Encyclopedia, um, another article from like 1911 or something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and I'm just thinking, OK, look, I will I will admit that there were there, there were Catholic historians in the early 1900s, late 1800s, who did hold to this theory. But that's the point, is that this is an early 1900s theory, and they were trying to be honest. Since then, this whole idea has been largely debunked. It's been largely left to the dustbins of history because there just simply isn't any good reason to think it anymore. Um, there's very little evidence that uh, the, the December 25th date for Sol Invictus in the Roman world predates the 300s it, it's just not there there's just no evidence for it yeah and Stephen Hyman goes on and notes this throughout the paper right. his whole point is that it's far more likely that the Christians just calculated it as Jesus's birthday and there's no evidence that Aurelian or anyone was really worshiping on that day mm -hmm. it wasn't celebrated by the pagans until after Constantine and Thomas Taley in his book uh the origins of the liturgical year uh notes that it's probably likely that Christians were keeping December 25th before Constantine because he notes there was a group called the Donatists, the Donatists that split from Christians around 310. And they kept all the feasts they had mm -hmm. prior to their split. So then they kept Christmas on December 25th. They didn't keep the Feast of the Epiphany, which wasn't established in the church until after. St. Augustine right. notes this. That implies when, bef that before this, this split happened, Christians were already keeping December 25th as the date of Christmas. So, no, he's wrong. We have evidence that Christians were keeping this before Constantine and then Constantine just established it as an official holiday kind of thing. So right. he leaves that entirely out. He doesn't engage with his scholarly work here. Yeah, and, it, and it's good to note just specifically because you always want to be, you, you do want to be careful when using heretics as, as pieces of evidence, but mm -hmm. uh, with the Donatists, their heresy was the notion of uh, someone who committed a sin ceased being Christian, basically. That... um someone or sorry that they that they had undone their baptism basically they they undid their christianity and so and they needed to be like rebaptized and, and things like that in other words their heresy actually doesn't have to do with anything involving the liturgical year or uh times or periods to celebrate uh yeah. the christian mysteries and so the fact that they did retain these shows that that was a common heritage before the split it's exactly. it is similar to how uh, many Catholics will will utilize Eastern churches and their various practices as as examples of okay, well, you can't say that this practice developed in say the 1400s in Western Europe because the Eastern Orthodox practice it, the the Syriac churches they practice it, the the Coptics they all practice it, um, and, and things like that. It, it, it's a similar line to that. Anyway. All right, let's move on to a little bit. We're going to start getting into Mithra, I believe, here. So let's oh, get into this. Right. Not only do we have Emperor Aurelian dedicating a temple to the sun god Sol Invictus in 274 AD. There's no evidence of that. That's that's a speculative theory that some scholars have suggested that maybe Aurelian in 274 dedicated a temple to Sol Invictus on December 25th. No inscriptions mention that. 
Jim is just lying here. There is no evidence of that. That is that is a pure conjecture. And even in the paper he quoted from, from Stephen Hyman's, he notes that. Yeah. Jim is not telling you the full details. It, it, it's interesting because there, there are a couple of points throughout this video and in, and in the original video as well, where he says, many scholars say, for instance, uh, something. But he doesn't actually cite any any scholars who do say exactly. this. Um, <laughs> and I'll admit, there when someone has proven themselves to be generally trustworthy, to be generally backed up by evidence, there is a ten I do tend to give leeway to to many people who are like, oh well, you know, it's it's a common historical consensus that X or whatever. And it's like, okay, you didn't cite anyone. I, I'm going to hold that as questionable, but, it, but it, you're probably right. But when someone gets all the details wrong and when they constantly misquote the scholars that they actually do mention, that, I'm sorry, it just doesn't cut it to say many scholars agree X or many historians say this or, or anything along those lines. It just simply doesn't cut it. And even if Aurelian did dedicate the uh, temple on December 25th, and even if there was a pagan holiday on December 25th, December 25th, that still would not be evidence or proof that Christians picked that date right. because of paganism. Because again, we can read John Chrysostom. We can read St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. They picked it because they actually thought that was the day Jesus was born. Why right. does Jim get to quote them when they're talking about pagan holidays, but he doesn't quote them when they're talking about their own beliefs? And it's and it's also good to note that um, with a few exceptions, so, so Julius and Augustus are, are kind of exceptions to this just because of how influential they were mm -hmm. generally especially in the later roman imperial period just because an emperor does something or establishes a feast does not at all mean that the rest of the empire is going to follow suit that my my best example for this off the top of my head is um uh shoot Who i give you one emperor? uh the establishing the date of easter uh at the council of nicaea uh, sure. There was still debate that followed after that, that up till about this time of St. Bede on how to properly calculate the date of Easter. So it's not like it was Relious. established in 325. Here's the date. No, that we still see debates actually happening. In fact, there was a, right. uh, a council called in Britain to try to, to figure out which calendar calculation to use. And then mm -hmm. Bede finally had the final word on that. I, I just remembered it. It's Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic, um, and he was, he's even considered one uh, a country like an actual contributor to Stoic philosophy. The majority of the Roman Empire did not adopt Stoicism, even when he was the one who, who was an emperor. And so the fact that, let, let, let's say that Aurelian, um, Aurelian specifically established a feast of on December 25th to Sol Invictus and, and establish a temple. Aurelian is ruling during the time of the crisis of the third century, when the entire empire is falling apart and he barely militarily put it back together. Unless I'm talking about it, unless I'm thinking about a completely different Aurelian, but I'm pretty sure that that's, mm. that's the guy. You um, say it is, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, you're right. During, during the crisis of the third century, something as basic as Greek and Latin learning stops, like splits the empire in half where, where the Western empire stops learning Greek for a time. And, and that is just goes on a long decline afterwards. Yep. The, the, the Eastern empire is not going to adopt a specific feast day just because Aurelian did, did it. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, even if, even if this were true, which I don't even think it is. But even if it were true, that is not good enough evidence to say that there's there was this universal Roman sun god worship on December 25th. Exactly. Yeah. All right. AD, archaeology has uncovered the sun oh, god Invictus minted on Roman coins in the 4th century, 3rd century, 2nd century, 1st century, and even as far back as the 1st century BC. Out of every god available in the pantheon, in every century that Rome existed, the emperor chose to have Sol Invictus as the head of every Roman coin. So, how does that establish anything about the date of uh, Sol Invictus? Just because we you know they worship Sol Invictus, that doesn't mean there was a holiday on December 25th. This is the kind of evidence Jim has to use to grasp at straws to argue that Christmas is pagan. It's utter nonsense. Indeed. All right, let's move ahead because I want to get to the, the myth. Yeah, because it, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where um, no one is arguing that Sol Invictus was a major god in at various periods in Roman history. 
the idea okay the idea though that it was the only god on coins is kind of weird but it yeah sol invictus was a was a deity mithras was <laughs> also a deity J jupiter was also a deity that doesn't mean that the christians took any any of the feast days um even if you could prove that they had it on a major christian feast day which he hasn't done and he doesn't do no. it still doesn't prove anything all right, so he just, he goes, he mentions Julian the Apostate. Again, he posts Philokalian calendar, post Constantine. Let's move ahead to this section, though. And the Roman sun god Mithras became one god, and his birthday was December 25th, and Sunday was his day. Which, by the way, is exactly why today most of Christianity has church and celebrates the Sabbath on Sunday. It's not because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. It's because the <laughs> Romans chose to officially change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday in 321 A.D., under Emperor Constantine, because that's the day the pagans had their Sabbath, and it was easier to get the pagans to convert to Christianity if they were allowed to keep their pagan traditions. This is laughably false. La First of all, there is no evidence Mithra and Sol Invictus were merged. None. No scholar says that. I told Jim this in November when I talked to him. He still puts it out there, and he he's given no evidence to back up this claim. He just asserts it because, again, he's got an agenda. So he's lying to you. He's lying to his audience because he's got an agenda that he's been corrected on this time and time before. And again, Christians were worshiping on Sunday in the first century. Right. It's it's in the Didache. It's in it's in Revelation. On it's in Saint Justin Martyr. It's in Irenaeus. It's in I forget if it's in uh, Ignatius. But point is, is that it's in. <laughs> Tons of authoritative early Christian documents. Like these aren't heretical, these aren't apocryphal documents or anything along those lines. It's in it's in like the compilation of the teaching of the apostles with the Didache. It's in very, very heavily revered and faithful and well martyred uh, early church fathers in the case of Ignatius and, and Saint Justin. It, so in order to in order to come up with this idea, you have to think that. Constantine retroactively changed history when he <laughs> proclaimed. Didn't we talk about this last time? Because sun, because we all know that Constantine didn't actually establish Sunday as the as the day of rest for Christians. He established it as an imperial day of rest because that was the day which Christians were keeping. Exactly, that it's it's the other way around. It, it in yeah. Michelle Sal, uh, uh, Salzman in her paper, I believe, uh, Pagan and Christian Notions of the Week, notes that the Mithraic use of Sunday postdates Christian's use. Right. So you can't claim that the we took this from the Mithraic cult. That's right. utter nonsense. And even if it if it did predate, that again would not mean it because again, st scholars will look at the immediate context. Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Okay, that's an important day now. Christians are going to celebrate and worship on that day. But and Jim just makes these logical leaps. In fact, I think it's actually important to note that mithraism is something which uh which arose after the advent of christianity and after a lot of these feast days were already established especially the roman Sunday. cult that started the roman cult well, yeah. spreading out through the roman empire yeah because myth was an old deity from persia for example yeah but, but was... mithraism in like mithras in in iran is not the same i i don't think it's the same it's mithras not. as the one in uh, in Rome, because Mithras in Iran isn't he the guy that you appeal to when it, when establishing a contract? Um, uh, there's a lot of differences. I know that um, okay. in Zoroastrianism and in India as well. Myth Mithra is different in each culture, and in the Roman culture, it's also very different. So yeah, yeah you're right about that. Because Mithraism so. in the Roman culture, I believe, was a, a soldier was primarily uh, worshipped by Roman soldiers. I might be getting yeah. all these details. No, 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 up, no but, you're right. He's Roman yeah. soldiers, yeah, because I've dealt with Jesus mythicists on this. But I think we're getting to the Pliny quote here. Oh, what you want to talk about? Yeah, accurate. We know that December 25th was originally on the winter solstice because Roman historian Pliny the Elder in 63 AD tells us exactly that. He says, quote, the Bruma, which is the winter solstice, begins on the eighth degree of Capricorn, the eighth day before the calends of January, which again is another way of saying eight days before the first of January, which is December 25th. That again, <sighs> I, I think, again, I think we talked about this last time, but this is probably his best quote other than maybe the Plutarch one. The problem the with Plutarch both one, he is, the Plutarch one, he bastardizes entirely. Well, yeah, but, but at the very least, the very <laughs> least it's before like the 300s. 
Uh, that's that's what I'm going off of. But again, it doesn't prove anything. That that's the thing is that his his earliest quotations from Plutarch and Pliny the Pliny the Elder is that these don't prove anything. Also, I would I would hesitate to call Pliny the Elder a historian. I also would he hesitate oh, to call Pliny the younger historian. I don't like when when Christians cite his letters as saying like, oh well. Christian histor like a, a pagan historian, plenty of the younger cited him. I'm like, eh, maybe. Yeah, yeah I see what <laughs> you're saying. Not really in a history, but yeah. But anyway. Here, here's, what, here's what Ronald Hutton says about this. So we know that the winter solstice on the Julian calendar was December 25th. Mm -hmm. We know. Here's what Ronald Hutton says about this, though. The official calendar of Julius Caesar marked them as the 25th, the winter solstice. The uncertainty was perfect. Was perfectly natural for at midwinter and midsummer the solar orb does appear to rise and set in the same places for a few days. The very term solstice is taken from Latin for the sun stands still. The traditional pagan calendar, however, had left this period as a quiet and mysterious one and flanked it instead with a festival of preparation and one of completion. The former was the feast of Saturn, the Saturnalia, and the days after December 17th, and the latter, the New Year Fest, that collide from uh, 1st to the 3rd of January. So Ronald Hutton once again says, just because the winter solstice was on December 25th, we don't have any evidence there was it actually actually a festival on that date. Mm -hmm. So Jim is just taking the fact that they marked this as the winter solstice, and he's extrapolating there was a holiday on that date. There's no evidence of it. Just like we don't have a winter solstice festival. We have right. Christmas a couple days later. Uh, we mm -hmm. care more about our actual the holidays that are sacred to us. Same with the Romans. Just because the sun was in a specific place, that doesn't mean they necessarily had a holiday yet. Not until after Constantine, right? And it and it's. I actually kind of want to highlight one one of the points that uh, Hutton makes, in that. Okay, well, this isn't really highlighting it, but anyway, point is is that uh, there there is a reason for why you don't usually have uh, feast days on the winter solstice whenever the winter solstice is dated. That's because of the fact that the specific time of the winter solstice is actually fairly hard to date exactly. especially in especially in uh pre-imperial like roman imperial societies so one thing that i think causes a lot of this confusion is that we we usually think of the two roman calendars as the julian calendar and then the gregorian calendar which didn't come around until after the renaissance because those it utilizes the month system that was set up by Julius. But the Julian calendar is actually of itself a reformation of an earlier Roman calendar, and which is also a reformation of another earlier Roman calendar, uh, which was set up by the second king of Rome, Numa Pompilius. Most of the ancient feast days and festivals that are associated with Rome actually come from the monarchical period or the early Republican period. They don't come from the late Republican period or the early Imperial period, which means that um, the, the dates are often not very well defined. So uh, the, the, the dates as it relates to things like solstices and equinoxes, they are not actually well defined, which is why we have things like December 25th being the day of of the uh, of the winter solstice the 25th of the months being the days of the winter of the solstices mm -hmm. and equinoxes it's it has it has to do with the fact that it's hard to tell exactly what day um of the year there's equal light and equal there's equal light and equal darkness during, throughout the day or the most light or the most darkness or where the sun stands still until you have more sophisticated means of calculation through astronomy so until that stuff gets developed like it does in the republican period you it, it doesn't really it doesn't you you lack sort a lot of precision what i'm saying is is that to highlight this point that hutton is making one of the reasons for why the Romans didn't have a feast day on December 25th is because they didn't act or on the winter solstice is because they didn't have a precise date for the winter solstice. They, they did it. They, they sort of said that it was on December 25th. I don't think anyone really thought, okay, this is the winter solstice. This is like the time of the exact winter solstice that we've calculated. Anyway, that's, that was a long tangent, but. I wanted to get to the Aztec thing. Well, I when when I saw this documentary, I just ignored this because this is just totally irrelevant. But you wanted to comment on it, and then I wanted I decided I wanted to say something as well here because it's part of Jim's really weird conspiracy. But let's play the Aztec clip and then go for it. 
Not only did they have many of their temples built with the winter solstice in mind, but according to Aztec theology, their god, Huitzilopochtli, was also said to be born on the winter solstice. And if we head back across the Pacific... Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, um, I wanted to respond to this point, because, okay, what is his point here? His point with this whole section and with various sections in the video is that Satan is constantly uh, utilizing uh, December 25th for sun god worship. And this is like the constant theme because this is how Satan wants it. Now, I think you would correctly say that even if that were true, it still doesn't prove anything. It, the, the notion that Satan can so corrupt something that God has made that it cannot be used properly for the worship of God is, is to say that Satan is more powerful than God. Um, yeah. But even ignoring that, I actually want to talk about this because even this, again, even if this were true, it wouldn't matter. But it's not even true because Huitzilopochtli isn't, okay, he is the sun god. But like he, in, in the Aztec religion, he wasn't born on December 25th. There isn't actually a date in Aztec mythology about when he was born. And the one, the, the festival uh, that is used to celebrate him in particular, um, Pen Quetzalitzli, um, it's not usually celebrated on December 25th. Now, there, it, this depends on how you date it, but, but it's a month-long celebration is the thing. It's not a day celebrate. It's not celebrated on a specific day. And usually uh, the, the correlation between it, Aztec calendar conversion into the Gregorian calendar is a little bit weird, but it's usually from like the end of November to early to mid December is, is mm. when it goes. The latest is usually December 19th. Now there is, there is one date for it, which is uh, like mid December to early January. And so, yeah, in, in that situation, you would have it <laughs> on the winter solstice, but it's not, on the winter solstice it's surrounding the winter solstice if, if you will but I, I another thing that i wanted to hone in on because of the fact that this relates to a lot of his earlier points about temples and and how they correlate to uh the um to the winter solstice there is a connection to which to in and the winter solstice in that one of his temp temples in the south forget exactly how it works but uh, the, faust, the south facing side of the temple um, is meant to represent something along the lines of the winter solstice. The reason for that, though, is in connection with like military campaigning season, because mm. which the Pochli is also a, a war god as well. In other words, the winter solstice doesn't actually have to do with the worship of which the Pochli. It has to do with something with, uh, with an effect that he had on society. And the reason for why I bring that up is because this could very easily be the purposes of all the different. We don't know what the purpose is for like why these temples were built in any connection to the winter solstice. It might not have had anything to do with that God or beings birth. It might not have had anything to do with the celebration of that or a time when you would sacrifice to that God or anything along those lines. It may very well have had to do with nothing. It may have had to do with timekeeping. It may have had to do with like a, any it might have had to do do with like a, a certain tree cutting ceremony that they had <laughs> it, it doesn't matter what it is because we don't know what it was and so to uh and so to uh extrapolate from the fact that there's some association between the winter solstice and these temples to say that therefore these pagans worshipped gods worshipped a specific god on december 25th in association with that God's birth, it's just complete speculation, which has no grounding in it. And in order to prove that Satan has set up December 25th as a specific day for sun God worship in all these pagan cultures throughout the world, you have to come up with, you have to have actual evidence. You can't just simply say the pagans did stuff on the winter solstice. I bet that they did. I bet they did do stuff on the winter solstice. I don't doubt that. But to say that it had to do with the worship of sun gods, and especially the birth of sun gods, that is something which simply there is no evidence for. And he certainly hasn't provided evidence for. Exactly. Okay. And yeah. again, 
what what is Satan's evil plan here? Like, okay, I'm gonna get them all to have a holiday honoring Jesus on December 25th. I win. Like, this is the dumbest enemy. This is supposed to be the chief of the angels. He's smarter than everyone out there, and he is this stupid. Like, Jim has not really explained this well because yeah. he just assumes that somehow if we celebrate God's feast, we're gonna get magical special blessings, which is just ridiculous. Uh, he's assuming his Torah observant mindset, which is rejected by like 99.9999999% of scholars out there. Mm -hmm. so like, I, I don't even know where, where he's getting this stuff from. It, it's ridiculous, but let, let, let's keep moving on here. Cause he's going to get, uh, he's going to get a lot of anti-Catholic stuff at the end, which I, I was, to. yeah, but I was just going to say, Jim has a very, uh, Jim very much underestimates Satan. Yes. He exactly. thinks that. Yeah. If you think this that this is what Satan's master plan is, anyway. <laughs> Worshipping the sun goddess every year on this day. And I'm certainly not saying that the Aztecs of the 13th century or Japanese Shintoism or any quote that I've mentioned after the 4th century has any influence on the decision in the 4th century to make Christ's birthday on December 25th. What I am displaying, though, is a pattern of sun god worship that happens to be on the winter solstice that's found on every continent for the last 5,000 years. Okay, actually pause it here. For and since one. we... Yeah, well, um, we already established this is this is just false. He has made up right. this conjecture from very, very limited data. But yeah, admittedly, I, I haven't looked at the Japanese. I, I don't I don't care much about the Amaterasu it's, goddess yeah. thing. I, I, I'm, You know what, Jim? I'll give you that one. <laughs> Everything that you say about Amaterasu, Amaterasu is, is totally correct. Here's the thing. Okay. Here's the thing. Uh, this is a, a great example of what I was talking about earlier. Jim clearly did watch her video. Yeah. It, this and that one quote at the very beginning where he's talking about how, you know, if you're a scholar, you might not agree with every single piece of evidence that, we, that we're going to present here. So, okay, so basically you did watch her video and you even took some of the criticisms into account be, or, or tried to make corrections by saying, okay, well, these guys clearly thought that uh, I was I was arguing that the the Christians in the fourth century took uh, when went to Japan or went to the Aztecs in the 1500s or whatever and took those dates when that's not what I'm saying. Okay, fine, but you can't if you're going to do corrections. I am talking to you directly, Jim. Jim, if you're going to do uh, corrections after you've received criticism. You have to actually take the real argument into account. You can't simply um, fix the editing mistakes like pointing on to December 23rd, uh, 31st with the Philokin calendar or uh, correcting the Plutarch date so that's no longer 65 because you realize that you can't just simply undo the editing mistakes, which are minor points that we were just sort of using to show that you made a sloppy video and completely ignore the actual takedowns of the real arguments that we were get that you were giving we weren't criticized if if you had just made a couple of editing mistakes we wouldn't have made the video we made the video because what you're saying isn't true and the quotes that you're using are deceptive you cannot edit your video a little bit more to take away some of the silly mistakes and keep the main mistakes of the video that we were criticizing that was what I wanted to say for this part. I, yeah, I agree. We know that the Aztecs had no clue that the Romans ever existed. Either they migrated originally from the Middle East thousands of years earlier and brought sun god worship on the winter solstice like the with them, Hold on. or they learned it directly from demons, possibly the same demons that they summoned oh, right. during their human sacrifices. Either way, it seems that one of the most important days of worship for Satan was on December 25th. Even modern-day Wiccans celebrate the birthday of their god on the winter solstice, celebrating it at none other than the ancient Stonehenge that we mentioned earlier. They call it, of all things, Yule Day, which is the same ancient name that Germanic and Scandinavian peoples gave it thousands of years earlier. And interestingly enough, the ancient Vikings refer to Yule Day as Odin's Day. Did you catch that? Okay. Out of every single day of the year, that they could have ever chosen to be Odin's Day, which is most scholars say is the precursor for the development of some of the attributes of Santa Claus, they chose December 25th. Okay, this is what I want to comment on. Okay, 
Modern Wiccans don't have a clue what they're talking about. Right. They don't open, like I've talked to some of them. They think Yule trees were part of the Yule festival. Utter nonsense. <laughs> they think the Christmas tree is a Yule tree. Yule was not placed on December 25th until King Hakan the Good put Yule on that date to coincide with Christmas, according to the Icelandic chronicler, Snorri Sturlson. He talks about this in the Heimskringa. Okay. Oh, also, I will actually, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Also, okay. there is no evidence Santa Claus is connected to Odin. This is a modern myth. I mean, people go, Odin have beard, Santa have beard. Coincidence? Like, there's no evidence of this. This is another modern myth. Jim has not researched at all. It, it's funny because um, there are characters who are inspired by Odin. So Gandalf, actually, from Lord of the Rings. Uh, Tolkien Tolkien specifically lists Odin as, as one of the inspirations. It's the note... and. The reason for why there's an actual connection there is because Odin was a wandering old man, a wandering deity sort of person. Santa Claus has basically nothing, basically nothing to do with um, with Odin. And we know that both time wise because of the fact that um, like Odin worship dies out. I think in the early like early eight hundreds or something along those lines in Germanic. Mm places we don't know 900 exactly. something along the point is is that odin stops being worshipped quite a while before a lot of the festival traditions around saint nicholas's feast day start to arrive furthermore saint nicholas's feast day on like december 6th it's not on december 21st uh 25th the, the uh i think you've mentioned in a past video sorry there yeah. is a train passing by i'm not sure if you can hear i don't it. barely hear it you're fine okay um there is a uh it was act it's actually an American thing, yeah. Uh, or it was originally an American thing to associate, um, maybe a British thing as well, to associate Saint Nicholas with Christmas in particular, and it was done by like Germans or the Dutch um, in the seven, like eighteen and nineteen hundreds. In other words, even if someone could prove that Yule Day was a thing and that it happened, it was Odin's day. Also, I do want to say. Vikings aren't an ethnic group. It's, <laughs> it's like a, it's basically a, a Germanic word, which means pirate is literally what the term means. So Vikings aren't a people group. So to say that the Vikings called it Yule Day is wrong, but that this is a minor point. If he takes the video down and corrects this, it's going to be another example of like, okay, dude, that was like the, one of the most minutial point, like my minute points that I was correcting. Anyway, I don't, I don't think he's going to take it down now. I think he's dug his heels and he's not going to change. And yeah. I just want his followers to see how he manipulates data for yeah, and, agenda. And honestly, I don't even think that we should respond again uh, if yeah. if he does do this again. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's get real going. quick. Uh, no, Odin didn't have reindeer. He had horses. He had a horse he rode. And then, then okay. the idea he had reindeer comes much later, 1800s, 1900s. People start associating Odin with reindeer because they're merging him with Santa as the American Santa spreads out around the world. So this is where Joel Apuki comes from. They took, in the 1920s, they took Santa and merged him with a pagan deity, Joel Apuki, in Finland. So it's the same kind of thing here. Uh, yeah, same kind of stuff we're getting. Yeah. All right, let's let's um, let's go to, I think I got the next one down. It's like, oh, Tertullian. Let's do Tertullian here because, oh my mm. goodness. This is Jim basically debunking his whole point. This He puts up a quote that debunks his whole point because that's how bad he is at this popular roman festival that ended right before the birthday of the sun god on the winter solstice and christians were getting caught up in the celebrations of it take a look at the following quotes from that early time period this is from tertullian an early church father from 145 to 220 a.d he says this and i quote but the same apostle talking about the apostle paul elsewhere bids us to take care to please all as i he says please all by all means no doubt he used to please them by celebrating the Feast of Saturnalia and New Year's Day. The Saturnalia and New Year's and Midwinter's festivals and Matronalia are frequented. Presents come and go, New Year's gifts, games join their noise, and banquets join their din. Oh, better fidelity of the nations to their own sect, which claims no solemnity of the Christians for itself. Not that the Lord's Day, not Pentecost, even if they had known about them, would they have ever shared them with us for they would have fear that they should seem to be Christians. Okay. Let's go back to the middle quote here. Okay. Because this is where it gets interesting right after this Paul one here. Okay. 
he, this quote basically debunks his whole point. Tertullian is listing Roman festivals. He mentions the Saturnalia, not the Saturnalia. I don't know why Jim adds another syllable in there. Saturnalia. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny that he corrected that. Uh, he corrected so many different points, but even, <laughs> we pointed out, I think, in the last video that it's not pronounced Saturnalia. It's pronounced Saturnalia or Saturnalia, if you want to use the American pronunciation. And he even pr mispronounces Tertullian's name. Yeah, he's now a Ninja Turtle, apparently. He's the yeah, first right. One. Uh, but notice what Tertullian says here in Of Idolatry. He's listing the Roman festivals in the winter. Mm -hmm. It goes from the Saturnalia to the celebration of the New Year to various midwinter mid mid festivals like Lupercalia and other ones. Then Matronolia, which is on March 1st, I believe. Yeah, okay. I think so. Notice what he leaves out in between Saturnalia, December 17th, and January 1st, the New Year. There's no festival in there. If he was listing major festivals, he would have included Sol Invictus right. or something that was on December 25th. This quote basically shows us that Tertullian didn't know of a mid big midwinter festival on December 25th. Otherwise, it's very likely he would have mentioned it in this list. This whole quote shows that Jim's entire documentary is riddled with faulty information left and right. I lost my uh, co-host. He should be back any minute now. But yeah, this whole shows us thing. And also, while we're waiting for the Jolly Viking to return, I do want to read more about Tertullian. He's back. But I do okay. want to read more about what Tertullian says in Of Idolatry. Jim is a Torah observant. Okay, Jim thinks you have to keep the Sabbath. You got to keep kosher laws, all this stuff. Again, it, when, I, when I deal with Torah observers, uh, disagreeing with them, it pushed me to read early church fathers and then pushed me more into traditional Christianity. But here's what Tertullian says in chapter 14 of, of, of uh, On Idolatry. He says, the Holy Spirit unbraids the Jews with their holy days. Your Sabbath is your new moons. Your ceremony, he says, my soul hates. By, by us to whom Sabbaths are strange, strange, and the new moons and festivals formerly beloved by God. The Saturnalia, the New Year's, the Midwinter Festivals, and Matronalia are frequent in. Present, come and go. New Year's gifts, games, join the noise. Banquets, join their din. Oh, better fidelity of the nations to their own sect, which claims no, sol no solemnity with the Christians for itself. So right here, Jim is taking this quote out of context because he doesn't want you to see the other parts of it. Right. Like, notice he mentions this part of the quote, but he won't mention other parts in chapter 14 where Tertullian condemns ta taking par partaking in the Sabbath or Jewish feasts as well. It's yeah. weird how he just quote minds this. <laughs> yeah, Tertullian... Um... I won't I won't say that he like had no love for the Jews, but he did he was very specific that Christians and Jewish people are not of the same religion. Um that we we celebrate different feast days. We sell we have different festivals and, and things like that. And so you can't um so yeah, he actually does I think he actually I forget if he forbids, it might not be here, but I think he actually forbids at another point Christians going uh to celebrate the Sabbath, um, even yeah. in spite of what the early practice of the apostles was. Um, yeah, I mean, like he with Saint James, says that this is not for Christians. So, right, it's weird that Jim wants to quote mine chapter fourteen because he's trying to argue that we need to keep Jewish feasts, and in the same chapter, he's where he's quoting quoting Tertullian as an authority who doesn't mention anything like Sol Invictus. Tertullian is saying, "Hey, don't do don't do what people like Jim say. Like, don't do that stuff." Right. Yes. <laughs> All right. You want to move ahead to the calculation theory now. You there? Looks like you yes, dropped out again. All right. Do you want to move out to the calculation theory now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that'll be good. I had okay. I had a, quite a few comments, I believe. Um, okay. On the yeah, Catholic, the Catholic. Oh wait, hang on. Sorry. Uh, I actually wanted to do um, around thirty to talk about his Syria, his, quoting um, Jacob Barsalabi. You got it. Uh, so since Christians everywhere were celebrating these pagan feasts, and the church couldn't get them to stop. The only option was to use the old, if you can't beat them, join them philosophy. And that's exactly what I believe that happened. By choosing the pagan feast day of December 25th as the birthday of Christ, the church could tell Christians to keep on celebrating, but now do so. A little bit more ahead? Yeah, there we are. Okay, you know, we'll move ahead there. It's powerful. Syriac Bishop Jacob Barsalabi says this in the 1100s. <laughs> this again. Quote, the reason why the fathers of the church moved the January 6th celebration to December 25th was this, they say. Listen carefully. 
It was the custom of the heathens to celebrate on this same December 25th, the birthday of the sun, and they lit lights on it to exalt that day. Even Christians were participant in these rites and ceremonies. When therefore the teachers of the church saw that the Christians inclined themselves to this custom, they established a plan. And what was that plan? The true natal feast, Christmas, would be celebrated on this day, December 25th, and the Epiphany on January 6th. Brothers and sisters, you can't get any more clear than this. All right. Yeah, can't get any more clear than that. They, you know, again, we acknowledge there was a pagan holiday on December 25th, but after Constantine, but go ahead. Yeah, so, okay. So I, I found it interesting that he he did this again because yeah, we talked about this. Um, I, I talked about how we, we talked about basically how, okay, 11th, an 11th century person isn't a very good source for what was going on in the early 300s or the 200s. But the interesting thing is that he seems to be taking this as representative of the Syriac tradition, which it isn't. And it's fascinating to it. The fact that he even seems to be saying that is a demonstration, in my opinion, that he doesn't even really understand what the Syriac tradition is, because there are like three or four traditions within the Syriac churches, depending on how you count. Um, what he's quoting is a single prolific uh, West Syriac or Jacobite Syriac bishop who was... Um, I forget where he was born, somewhere in like northern Mesopotamia. In other words, he's quoting a very, very specific tradition and a very, very specific author from a on a late date in order to prove that this is some sort of like Syriac tradition that goes anywhere back to the early church. You'd at the very least have to quote, you know, East Syriac or Nestorian um, traditions. You'd have to quote uh, like the, the sort of Orthodox um Historians, because the interesting okay, so here's the interesting thing about the Syriac Church: you have the quote unquote East uh, Nestorian <clears throat> Nestorian East Syriac Church, which is associated with Syria, um, that broke off from the rest of the church after the Council of Ephesus or Ephesus. Um, you have the, the Jacobite Church, which uh, broke off during the reign of Justinian. Um, mm -hmm. You, but you still have Syriac churches which were in communion with um, what we call the Greek Orthodox and the Western churches. And there are still those two traditions today. You still have, um, I believe there are many Melkites who are um, who are associated with the Eastern Orthodox. There are Maronites who are specifically associated with, uh, with uh, the Catholic Church being in union with Rome. And so, no, it, it, you cannot simply cite a single, a single voice from one of these traditions and use that as evidence that the entirety of the of the Syriac Church like knew just knew that the reason for why December twenty fifth was chosen is because of uh, is because of like the, the the sun god worship. This this is an element. It's a different type of sloppiness compared to um, what we saw last time with a lot of the editing mistakes. But it's it's a type of sloppiness. It's it's a sort of scholarly sloppiness, which reminds me of. Um, it reminds me of something from Alexander Pope, which I was going to uh, quote at the end of the video if if, uh, if we get the chance. But for now, for now, we can move on. Yeah. And all I would say is that, again, the actual origin of claiming December 25th was chosen for paganism comes from the Greek and West split. Uh, mm -hmm. Greek bishops are accusing the Western bishops of choosing December 25th because of paganism. But there was no evidence for it. It came from this biased division when they had with the Holy Catholic Church. So that was actually where that comes from. Uh, and people don't realize it. So you're quoting very biased bishops that are writing long after this. And this is why historians don't take them very seriously. Right. Um, all right, let's move ahead to three to 39 minute mark. Because we'll get into a little bit of the calculation theory. We addressed a lot of this last time. Let's just briefly hit on it. Day of Christ. The strange part about all of this is that those who support this argument are saying that the church didn't choose December 25th because of any kind of syncretism or merging of pagan ideas, yet we're supposed to believe that they chose December 25th because a few early church writers came up with that date using pagan traditions and ancient Jewish superstitions? That doesn't make any sense. Every early church writer on this subject uses legitimate formulas for trying to figure out the death and birth of Christ, except for the ones that came up with the December 25th date. They used a formula based on superstition.
Furthermore, to believe that the Catholic Church was somehow a purist in this decision and would in no way mix paganism with the holy, you'd have to ignore all the facts of history and even modern history at that. After all, they've had no problem putting the same solar disk behind the heads of all their saints that the pagans use behind their solar deities. All right, let's stop here for a minute. So Jim tries, he goes through Hippolytus of Rome earlier in this, which we addressed last time. He ignores Thomas Schmidt's work on Hippolytus' work on the Chronicon, showing that Hippolytus did think Jesus was born on December 25th. Right. Uh, again, we addressed that last time. No need to rehash it out. Jim is dismissing the calculation theory uh, with a double standard here. He is saying that, oh, yeah, some Christians may have calculated December 25th to be the date of Jesus, but do you really think that's enough evidence to say that that's why they chose it? Yeah, because if you read John Chrysostom, if you read Augustine, the people you quoted, Jim, <laughs> they say that they actually believed that Jesus was born on that day because they had the church had calculated it to be that day. What modern historians like Schmidt, Taylor, No Fat Note will tell you is that we see this time and time again. We see Christians doing calculations, and we also see Christians saying the reason why we picked this date is because we think Jesus was actually born on this day. We have zero early Christian sources saying that we picked this day so that we could convince the pagans to start worshiping Jesus. So right. he's got no textual evidence for his case, but he will have this extremely high standard or shifting the goalpost for the calculation theory. And he thinks he can make the pagan theory from just very sloppy reading of historical sources. Uh, I'm noting that the Julian calendar had the winter solstice on December 25th. It's a, such a double standard. He has this very low standard of evidence he's got to reach, but he's got this extremely high bar for the calculation theory. And again, he's in the very far minority when it comes to modern historians. No one takes this nonsense seriously. So he's not only is he lying to his audience, he's arguing via a double standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is interesting because one of the things that he says is true. It is true to say that uh, other Christians calculated different dates for the birthday of Jesus. So, for instance, one of the more popular, um, one of the more popular dates in the East, at the very least, for the birthday of Jesus was uh, January sixth. Yeah. Um, in the in the West and in many Eastern churches, that that's uh, considered to be the Epiphany, the day of the Epiphany. Now, for some reason, Jim seems to think that th this is because of the drifting caused by the Julian calendar. When that that's not true in fact i think that um i think that right now the julian calendar uh the julian calendar's date for december 25th is january 5th not january 6th i might mm -hmm. be totally wrong maybe it's january 7th point is is that it, it's not january 6th i don't think but even if it were that that's not why there's a there's a discrepancy there but um, also, do you yeah. want to comment on the solar discs behind all the saints' uh, heads there? <laughs> so this is, yeah, um, I'll, I'll comment on this right now. So oh, here's the God. interesting thing about uh, the, the concept of solar discs. Now, there is, there is an association with um, a round, bright disc and the sun, because this is, uh, this is part of depictions of Apollo. Um, and uh, there, there are a couple of other examples of this. But the thing is, is that halos as a general concept are not specifically associated with with solar depictions or solar worships yeah. and we know this because if you look at other examples of halos some of them are square some of them are blue some of them are um some of them are uh well basically there are a bunch of different shapes usually it's usually it's either a square or a circle um point is is that or rectangle uh but point is is that it's meant to show, it is meant to show brightness and light like coming off of it. But the thing is, is that this is like a biblical concept of the holier people you are, the holier you are, the more closely you are associated with and have contact with God. You well, have a sort of Moses. Internal Moses had a, Moses yes, had a exactly. shining. It's connected to that. But even, well, yeah, so there, there, there is a, there is some dispute about whether or not Moses was depicted as having a halo uh, in, mm. in early Christian depictions. But the point, point is, is that even like with the transfiguration in Jesus, there, there is, there is this idea of radiance coming from someone who is, uh, who is sort of uh, clothed in glory, but more importantly, but more importantly, the point is, is that uh, the, the, uh, the halo 
is not a solar disk. It, that's not what it is. It is, yeah. uh, and you can, and I can prove that based off the fact that it doesn't always look like what's on screen right now. You can see several, like for instance, I believe Pope Isidore um, is depicted in many I icons as having, um, as having a rectangular blue halo around his head rather than a yellow circular halo around his head. And so it, you need, at the very least, you need more of a causal connection to say that, oh, this is based off of sun worship or or anything like that. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the only other thing I want to comment on is towards the end here, because we're going to get into Jim's anti-Catholicism stuff. Here, Although but... I think that if you continued, he does get to some of the anti-Catholicism. Um, uh, with the statues? Yeah. So the statues and then a lot of, and then like uh, the, the feast day stuff. All right, let's talk it. They've had no issue putting actual pagan statues in the Vatican itself, even renaming some of them to the names of biblical characters, such as Peter, Mary, and even the baby Jesus. Even Pope Francis had okay, no actually, problem in controversially that. displaying. Yeah, I already dealt with the Pachamama thing, so we can probably just skip that. Um, okay, so statues. So here's the thing. Um, this is something where I, I always feel like, as a Catholic, I can never... I, could, I just can't win because we get blamed for destroying the, the Roman forum or pagan temples or things and just being total iconoclasts and destroying cultures. When in reality, all, all it was is that like Italian peasants were being like, hey, we don't worship Zeus anymore. We don't worship Jupiter anymore. Let's use some of the nice stones that make up this <laughs> temple as a, to build some houses, you know, things that we actually need in the early Middle Ages. Um, but then, and, and, and here's the interesting thing. Early Christians did destroy Roman statues and did destroy pagan temples. Yeah. We did a lot. The Serapeum, um, for example, you know. Exactly. It's because, and it's, and here's the reason there was a danger. There was a danger of recent converts from going back into their old habits of worshiping pagan gods. It, it's mm -hmm. like what you do see in the Old Testament, where uh, the, the, the Israelites do not actually uh, successfully or intentionally subjugate the entirety of Canaan, and they allow Canaan worship and, uh, and Canaanite cities to, main, uh, to maintain, and so they keep getting tempted into idolatry. It, a similar thing was going to, a similar thing was a potential problem in early Christian Europe, you still had vast amounts of the countryside, which were still pagan, which still worshipped the pagan gods. What you do see, however, is that after all of this paganism has been thoroughly cleansed, then the church does allow a recognition of the artistic beauty that mm -hmm. was done. They allow artists to uh, to sort of uh, look after the to to sort of research. The Roman forms. So, for instance, um, like Laocon and his sons being killed by the snakes, which is a direct reference to the uh, to the Aeneid, actually. Uh, that is, and, and to a Greek story, that was used as a template in many ways of early Rena or of mid Middle Renaissance art and Middle Renaissance statue making. It's because of the fact that that paganism wasn't a danger for most Christians during. During Renaissance Italy, Renaissance Italy is not the place where paganism is going to sprout up. And so you do see that trend. You see an initial sort of iconoclasm of, of uh, destruction, destroying the pagan idols and destroying paganism and making sure it's completely rooted out. And once there isn't a danger of reverting to paganism anymore, because all the habits and, and customs related to paganism have been cleansed, then you see a reintroduction. And you can see this because we, the Catholic Church didn't open up temples to <laughs> to Isis and Horus. Um, it didn't open up temples. First off, Ariadne and and Laocon are not Roman or Greek gods. They're not pagan gods. They're they're pagan. They're classical figures from from yeah. mythology. Yeah. They're not. They're not. They were never worshipped <laughs> in the first place. That that's part of why I was annoyed at this. Um, so they're they're and they're being put up in museums. What are museums for? Are they for worshiping God? No, they're not for worshiping God. They are for preserving art. And so to blame the Catholic Church for for preserving artistic merit is really bizarre. It uh, is. Know. 
it, it, it's just you, the Catholic church can't win. It's like, they're constantly right. accused of destroying paganism or like reviving it. It's like a lot of these conspiracy theorists just are going after the big dog because the Catholic church is the biggest church around the world. Uh, it, it, so they want to go after the big dog is like, yo, this is the real bad guy here. Yeah. It's, it's the it's, heads I win tells you lose sort of thing. Yeah. Playing modern pagan idols in the church. In 2019, again, he said that they part, were. The I wanted to go to the uh, to the the um, John the Baptist, and uh, I think it's that, I think that's uh, earlier, like that's, the John the Baptist and Halloween. No, it's, it's right after this. Yeah, yeah. Displayed, but quote without idolatrous intentions. Now, would any of you have a pagan idol in your own home just for display? No. Yep. Well, I mean, I got this thing when I went to visit uh, the temple in Cancun, uh, Chichen Itza. Oh, yeah. I thought it was cool. I mean, like, it's just a, it's. What, you, it's a coaster. I mean, like, oh no! I put my drink on the defeated pagan deities. <laughs> End of the world, everyone. Like, and if that's all. not enough, they got John the Baptist's birthday on the summer solstice. Chose All Saints Day to be on the pagan Day of the Dead, which became the famous Halloween of today. Which... <sighs> okay, lies. so um, other yeah. lies. So here's an interest. Here's what I found always fascinating about the accusation with like John the Baptist is that this actually speaks to a real interesting quality of the of the church's liturgical year. Where, let okay, let's say let's actually say for a moment that um that Christ was born on uh, that Christ's birthday was put on December 25th to be on the uh, on the winter solstice and John the Baptist's birthday was uh, feast day was put on December 20th uh, on on uh on june 24th to match up with the summer solstice here's the interesting thing about that that's echoing one of the lines from john's gospel where john the baptist says to his disciples when they get worried that well, well jesus is stealing all your disciples doesn't that make you concerned and john says no the whole reason for why i am here is specifically to set things up for him he must increase and i must de decrease mm -hmm. and what happens to the sun after december 25th it increases guess what happens to the sun after june 24th it decreases this is actually speaking to a truth about the gospel and so to to say that this has to do with pagan let's say that this now i actually think that this was ac accidental and just happened to be really really awesome but let, yeah. let's say that this was intentionally chosen it was intentionally chosen to echo a biblical truth and furthermore the reason for why i always get super like pissed off at the whole halloween thing Halloween isn't a feast day in the church's liturgical <laughs> calendar. It's a day of fast and preparation for the actual feast day of All Saints Day on December on November 1st. So to to say, oh well, the pagans had this huge feast on October 31st or the equivalent of October 31st. Well, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You have just proved that what the Catholic Church did is they took this pagan festival that apparently existed in Ireland and somehow had an influence on the Pope. <laughs> they took this pagan feast day and turned it into a day of fast in preparation for an awesome feast day of all saints. Yeah, <laughs> none of it. In Ronald Hutton notes, there's actually no evidence that all... that. Yes, yeah, there isn't the, um, any evidence, but even if there were... Yeah, there's no evidence. What is it called again? Samhain. There's no evidence Samhain was actually... Right on that date it probably moved around because it was a solar lunar calendar in the north mm -hmm. uh we don't have see any evidence that we see actually we see in the ireland that all saints day was in april originally in that region and then mm -hmm. they followed the germanic date later which came a couple hundred years later or so so yeah once again there, jim gets whole, all of his history wrong yeah there, there's a whole controversy when it comes to like the irish uh the irish calendar and, and stuff like that but that that's a that's a huge discussion for a completely different time. Yeah. And I have a whole video on that. If you want to know, but um, I did want to get to uh, what is it? 47 minutes in yeah. because this is the anti-Catholic stuff, which I'm just sick and tired of Catholics or Christians. Uh, I, I hate these when different sects attack each other in like this, this kind of way, but you'll see. So when the sun is fully set, what we discover is the enemy's trying to hide our inheritance. He's stolen it. And in place of it, he's given us a Catholic feast day holiday schedule that's pulled our attention and destroyed our ability to teach our children the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you're a Catholic and you're okay with the fact that the church replaced God's calendar with their own, 
then I suppose it makes sense for you to celebrate Catholic holidays. But if you're a believer that truly wants to follow God's word and be in rhythm and in sync with his ways, doesn't it make more sense for us to start learning his calendar? This is really just incredibly rude. This is gaslighting. It's condescending of him. If you want to learn the truth, you gotta. You can't follow the Catholics. Like it's it's begging the question against Catholicism, first of all. But also, right. he actually thinks if we celebrate Christmas, we can't teach our kids the truth. Like we're we're, we're prohibited from a, obtaining Jesus, who is truth. Like what sort of utter nonsense, legalism mindset mindset are we dealing with here? Well, Mike, don't you know, uh, if you try to open up the Bible on December 25th, it actually <laughs> spontaneously combusts. And so it, it makes it, it, it's actually very fitting that the um, the Antichrist popes of the early church and Middle Ages chose um, December 25th, because what this means is that you actually cannot use that date as a day of biblical illumination. It's impossible. I've tried. <laughs> Every single time I open up my Bible on December 25th, it, the, the words they smear over. They're they're back oh to normal goodness. the next day. On the feast of Saint Stephen. But <laughs> this is this is utterly ridiculous. And this is again, as I said yeah. before, dealing with Torah observers like Jim didn't make me want to be a Torah observer. It, it made me in like hit all this anti-Catholicism stuff, like this anti-traditional Christianity, this anti-Orthodox, uh all of the anti-traditional Christian stuff pushed me in that direction. It's yeah. Torah observers, horribly bad arguments. Yeah, and I'm like, you know what? That. You know, like maybe I do want to celebrate Ash Wednesday now, Jim. Like, you thank you. You've convinced me. <laughs> like, yeah, and I'm presuming that most of your, well, at the very least, uh, a plurality of your viewers aren't Catholic or Orthodox, um, or maybe even not yeah. traditional, like Anglican. No, um, I have I have Pentecostal viewers. I have Baptist, Evangelical. Right. I have Catholic, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, you name mm -hmm. it. I mean, I have every denominator because I, I just I said this channel is about defending Christianity. And so I get annoyed yeah. when I see Protestants attack Catholics, Catholic attack Protestants. I'm like, guys, we got to work somewhere together. Else. Like, we got to work together now. Okay. Like, you can yeah. have these talks over a beer. Right now, there's a little bit more of an important issue going on right now. Let's get <laughs> to the important things here. Let's work together. Like, First Corinthians chapter one. And then you deal with these people that are like, these evil yeah. Catholics, they took over sun worship because they don't want you to know the truth or have power. If you celebrate Yom Kippur with me in Missouri, you know, you'll have so much power. It's like this is really bordering on dangerous theology. Well, yeah, and I think that's why it's it's useful to point out that Jim isn't uh, nice. Um, Jim, Jim isn't. He's not just attacking Catholicism. A lot of. A lot of very fringe sects of of, uh, of Protestants or or what have you. I, you could probably say that Torah observers aren't genuinely Protestant, but that, that's that's a different discussion. Point is that a lot of fringe sects of Christianity, they'll try to make it so that it's just the, it's like the Catholic Church versus all other churches or things like that. What you got to realize is that when when Jim attacks Catholicism in this video, he's not attacking specifically just the roman catholic church he's attacking every single what you might call like an apostolic church a church which claims apostolic succession through bishops he's attacking every single church that has any sort of a liturgical calendar that's based on tradition uh like the the christian tradition rather than the jewish one he's not just attacking catholics he's not just attacking orthodox and and, uh, and syriac churches or the coptics or even anglicans he's attacking baptists He's attacking uh, like any sort of traditional Baptist church. He is attacking, um, to some degree, he's attacking Presbyterians because of the fact that Presbyterians worship God on the Lord's Day on on Sunday. He's attacking, um, he's attacking Mennonites. He's attacking the Amish. He's attacking literally every single Christian de denomination, outside of a very, very, very specific subset of Christians who are specifically, as you say, Torah observers. And I think that's a useful thing to keep in mind is that this isn't a Catholic. This isn't about Catholicism. I know that I'm, I am Catholic and I do believe that Catholicism is the true church and things like that, but it's not, this isn't a me versus him thing, or even a Michael versus him thing. This is a near the universal voice of Christianity yeah, versus exactly. his small subset of Christianity. Just something to keep in mind. Yeah. And again, 
the, the theologians for the past 2000 years have agreed on disagreed on many things they mm -hmm. fought about you know what christians have basically unanimously agreed on for 2000 years are we don't have to keep jewish feasts the sabbath kosher laws right. anymore we worship on sunday like and all of a sudden torah observers like jim show up and they're like no no, no we got to write now there are some very smart torah observers out there for example sure. my brother-in-law david will very smart guy vehemently disagree with him on this topic but like for, for the way Jim is going about this is just really just, it's gaslighting. It's dishonest. It's just, and again, you're a pretty, he's again, you're right. He's actually going after so many Christians about something mm -hmm. that's so minute and doesn't matter. This is legalism. Right. Who cares what the pagans did on December 25th? What are you doing? All right. It doesn't matter what days they picked. Just like it doesn't matter that the ancient pagans of Canaan worship the Zucru festival in the fall. Right. On this, days of the Jewish holy feast. It doesn't matter. Uh, we can have our Christian feast days to honor the events of the Gospels. And I'm, I I actually quite enjoy them. I enjoy studying the tradition and the history there. So it's just frustrating. It's the, the conspiracy theorists need to stop and they need to just have a nap, I think. They're just they're yeah, in fact, wasn't wasn't the feast of booths actually technically um the greatest feast day? Of uh of the three major pilgrimages, or was it was it still? I'm not entirely sure. I can't remember okay. exactly. Because it's I I so I remember one of my theology professors explained it as we like Christians. Obviously, Easter is our our biggest feast day, but Passover, the the relevant Jewish parallel, wasn't actually the um the most major feast day in the Jewish calendar. Um, you had Passover, and then you had what we call Pentecost, but the, the feast 50 days after Passover. Passover obviously rec commemorates the going uh, coming out of Egypt. Uh, the Pentecost feast commemorates the giving of the law. But then I believe the Feast of Booths actually commemorates the entrance into the promised land. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain on this. So I, I might be totally wrong. Someone who's more knowledgeable about this can, can uh, correct me in the comments. But I think the Feast of Booths or uh, Sukkot, which happens in the uh, in the fall, might actually be the most important feast day in the Jewish calendar. Again, any I think, Jewish, I think any Jewish I'm pretty sure Yom Kippur is, but I'm not, I, I okay. I yeah, I'm, I might be totally yeah. messing things up. Um, yeah. But a, Jew, a Jewish uh, Jewish person can correct me down in the comments. So. I want to um, just quickly respond to this comment here. Why are you so mad and frustrated about celebrating biblical holidays instead of Christmas? You know, the apostles never celebrated Christmas. I'm not mad about it. Uh, I know they never celebrated Christmas because the church was still forming itself. And I'm not mad about if you want to celebrate Jewish holidays, more power to you. I again, I have never been against that. I get mad when Torah observers go, you know, really want to get close to jesus you got to be like us it's this legalism i i get annoyed well, i'm mad when about people lying me. that's <laughs> yeah me too i think that's what i'm primarily mad about i get annoyed when christians say you know like king james only so if you really want to love jesus right. like you gotta you can only read the king james or if you really want to love jesus you, you can't drink alcohol or you got to worship on saturday or you know you can't eat meat or, you know it's like I, christians are constantly trying to add to the gospel and like it it shows you it's from legalism. That's this is what this is. They, they think they gotta help the gospel along. The gospel is, you know, love the, like believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Love God, love everyone else, be baptized, partake of the Eucharist. These are the essential aspects. And then right. reply Romans 14, that kind of aspect to other parts of this thing. You want to keep them and you think it's gonna help you grow in Christ, then I want you to. But don't then turn around and get mad at me because I think, you know, I, I found that doing you know, like Ash Wednesday, for example, has helped me in my faith. Don't turn around and go, you know, you're not really growing with Jesus because you're doing that. You should do it more like me. This is purely celebrate Lent. I know. Like it's, it's so like, why don't we just try to be Christians and preach the gospel and say, you know what? If you want to keep kosher laws, that's going to help you. I support you do it. But don't get mad at me if I think that's not going to help me. That's going to make me feel like I'm falling into legalism, for example. Uh I'm not mad about it. I'm mad about the lying and I'm mad about people saying you got to do, you got you can only worship Jesus a specific way. We as Christians need to stop that. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans 14 is a very important chapter. We really need to take to heart. Yeah. I think a great example of, of this sort of thing is that I, I remember I was, uh, 
I was staying with a group of vegans who were Christian. Um, and uh, they were talking about how, like, it is a religious veganism that they practiced. However, when my, uh, when my other friends came in with pizza, the, none of them, like, rioted or raised a massive <laughs> objection because they recognized that this was, this was a personal thing. They recognized that it's not something that scripture commands us to do. That veganism isn't something that uh, that scripture commands of us. In fact, if anything, scripture technically commands the opposite. But that that's not that's not really a point that I'm I'm trying to make against veganism. And they they recognize this fact of okay, yeah, Will doesn't practice religious veganism or any sort of veganism. So we we can't simply he, he's going to be vegan while while he's in our house, but we're not going to force him if he were to go outside to to do it. And I think that that's more of an attitude, especially when it comes to these sorts of things that that Christians need to adopt. There's all sorts of different practices that that people have, um, and especially in Catholicism, there's all sorts of different uh, devotions and prayers and, and things like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to do it. Yeah, I'm Baptist, and my wife is Catholic. We both love Jesus, and that's all that matters. You know, at the end of the day, yeah, we can debate about different things here and there, uh, but I mean, like. I, Let's unite as a church, at least. I, I think this is very important that we as Trinitarian Christians, that anyone who can profess the Nicene Creed, you're a Christian, is my view, yeah. basically. So um, I do want to do, you wanted to bring up one more quote, but, I, but while you're getting that quote ready, you mentioned something at the end. Here's everyone's channel. I'll link it below, the Jolly Viking. You can go watch his great uh, uh, replays on Rings of Power. And when season two comes out, some of my... Um, some of my followers actually asked that you come back on my channel if Rings of Power season two comes out and we review some of the episodes. We might do that. that yeah, happens. I don't think I'm going to be able to do like another episode by episode breakdown uh, like I did uh, in this past fall. But I if, if we're just coming on to talk about season two, um, <laughs> I, I'd actually really like to do that. Um, definitely. Uh, yeah, we'll, I will we'll, say we'll plan for that. Yeah, I didn't I, I haven't actually posted really any new videos except for maybe the here we go again thing since our last video. I am still working on videos. I have about five that I'm going to post very soon. Um, the scripts for them are almost done. Then I just need to record. I'm almost done with the the rewrites. Sorry for it taking so long for all of, for like the hundred of you who subscribed. Very sorry about that. Yeah. So. The quote that I wanted to do, so Alexander Pope, he he's a, a sort of Catholic writer in England at, during the 1700s. He wrote a brilliant essay called The Essay on Criticism, um, which is a poem, but it's also an essay. And as I watched this video where St Staley is coming up with all these different things, he's he's delving into all these different subjects, which he doesn't know much about, this quote came up. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Parian spring. Their shallows draught intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. First, uh, Ferd beats first sight with that what the muse imparts. In fearless youth, we tempt the heights of arts, while from the bounded level of our mind, short views we take, nor uh, see the lengths behind. But more advanced, behold the strength surprise, the strange surprise, new distant scenes of endless science rise. And he goes on, but point is, but the basic point is, is that the Dunning-Kruger effect is a thing. That's exactly what he was saying. It, there's, there is this tendency where when you first delve into something, when you first delve into learning a language or learning some aspect of history or learning some aspect of mythology, you're reading popular stuff or introductory stuff, which is supposed to give you a general feel of things. And it gives you this impression that you know so much about the topic that you know so much about the Greek language or you know so much about Aztec mythology or things like that. <laughs> and maybe I've given off the impression that I know tons of stuff about this. Uh, I am me I'm mediocre when it comes to Aztec mythology, which is why I try to refer to people who do know more. And the problem is, is that you say things that you heard someone else say without checking the original sources, without learning the actually learning the language yourself if i, I tell my students because i'm a language teacher you, you you think that like all that all that's needed is for you to just like find a language that you actually want to learn and then you'll learn it no you won't 
if you if you won't if you can't sit down and learn like the vocabulary and the grammar and like the translation and the understanding of the internal logic of of any of a language of any language you can't do it for any other language that's just that is just how it works and so when i see a video like this it just screams to me this whole thing of i've i've done some research and i'm going to present that to you guys without actually checking people who have done the work, who have yeah. done the boring stuff, basically. That's, that's, that's really the point is that you need to sit down, you need to do the boring stuff. Yeah. And it takes time, it takes yeah. effort, and it takes perseverance. But if you don't do it, you're going to end up making tons of drastic mistakes, which may be fine if you're a college freshman just talking with friends and spouting off your uh, certain opinions. But when you actually present that information to the public from a position of authority, that is bad. You are going to deceive people. And if we're going to have a passion for truth, we need to make sure that what we're actually saying is the truth. And that's all I had to say about that. Yeah. By the way, I figured out, you're right, you don't look like Jim Gaffigan. But you do have, you sound like him. That's your voice is similar to his. Yeah, I can kind of. That's see that. where it comes from. So that's why people keep thinking you look like Jim Gavigan because they're hearing you and they're seeing your you have the same hair color and beard kind of thing. And they're going, Jim, you don't look like him. You do sound like him though. If any of my students are watching, watching, it's still the tension. If you start calling me Jim. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks my for everybody coming. Thank you. Everybody. We're going to end this broadcast. Thanks for coming. We'll be back. I'll be back with the Jelly Viking, probably with Rings of Power. We'll talk to you all later. Mm -hmm.